This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. In many ways, Karl Menger is the forgotten man of Austrian economics, but without him and his work, we wouldn't have the Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek we know today. In fact, when Menger published his Principles of Economics in 1871, it caused an absolute earthquake of our knowledge of economics at the time. Not only did he give us a whole new theory of value, which we term the marginal revolution, but he also gave us a new method for economic theorizing that Ludwig von Mises would later build into the science of praxeology. He also gave us an explanation for the origins of money as the most marketable commodity in any economy. Menger is a giant. He's often overlooked, but his Principles of Economics is not only one of the seminal Austrian texts, it's one of the most important economics books ever written. And here to explain why Menger matters and how important his work is, is our own Dr. Joe Salerno. Dr. Joe Salerno, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm happy to be here, Jeff. Thank you for asking me. Well, I'm just noticing it's just a, almost 100 years since Menger died. He was born in 1840, died in 1921 in February, both dates. Yes. And, it, you know, in some ways, he's almost the forgotten man of the Austrian school. It's strange. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, uh, given that he was really the, the founder of the Austrian school. Well, we have to first and foremost, I suppose, talk about his book, Principles of Economics, and the context in which he wrote it and in which it was published. I mean, first of all, this is a remarkable book for its time. He's, he's creating a theory of value. He's creating a methodology. He's creating these things out of whole cloth. Yes. He, um, in fact, uh, brought to the world something that was new under the sun, that is um, an integrated theory of economics based on subjective value with the principle of marginal utility as, as, one, as one of the keys. Well, and there's obviously several editions in English of Menger's principles written in his original German. A couple of things really strike me. First of all, <laughs> it was almost 70 years before this book was ever translated in English, which means a lot of British economists labored without its use for many, many decades. And also uh, that it's just so clear as, a, as someone who doesn't speak much German whatsoever. I find this book very, very readable in English. It's a, ver it's a very good translation, but also Menger himself is a very, very clear thinker because if you look at some of his other translated works, they're also very clear. Um, I don't think uh, the next Austrian economist that, that was, uh, had the same degree of clarity was Mises. They both wrote extremely clearly, and, and their thoughts were uh, just unfolded in, in, in a very natural way. So the first English edition, I, I'm fortunate to have a copy in my possession that belonged to Bettina Graves. Many of you will know her as a longtime bibliographer and assistant to Ludwig von Mises. And she was an expert in Austrian economics. So I, I'm able to enjoy her notes in the margins of this book, which has really been fun for me over the weekend. Um, the first English version has an introduction by Frank Knight, which is not particularly kind to Menger in some ways. Can you talk a little bit about Frank Knight? Yeah, Frank Knight is was the uh, leader of the uh, first Chicago school. Um, and he was uh, one of Friedman's teachers. And uh, he uh, disliked intensely the Austrian emphasis on the element of time in economics. And that pervades Menger's book. And so uh, he was in a, a debate with Hayek and with Machlup and Mises um, over the um, notion of time and capital. Uh, he didn't believe that, that it was a useful concept uh, time in, in capital. So he is really attacking Menger, but with, uh, in the background, of course, this is all this is being aimed at, at Hayek, Mises, and, and other Austrian capital theorists. Right. Of course, he's writing this in 1950 or thereabouts, yes. long after Menger's gone. And he is attacking, ap actually, openly Mises and Fetter. Uh, he talks about how uh, the outright time preference theory of interest has been achieved. And he questions whether it's of any use. Uh, but he also questions Menger's overall framework. In other words, how does Frank Knight end up writing the introduction of this book at all? You know, I don't know the background of that. I know James Dingwall was the um, the translator, correct? But, um, you know, I, that's something we should look into. It would be very interesting to find out who requested that night, that night write the introduction. Uh, someone, it seems like someone wants to sabotage the book. It almost reads that way. It's, it's very strange in that sense. And if you can find an original uh, first English edition of this book, uh, try to do so because you'll, you'll get to see uh, Frank Knight's introduction. And maybe we'll PDF it and put it online so that people can just find that. That's a good idea. Um, 
we also have a paperback of it that, that the Mises Institute published with an introduction by Friedrich Hayek and a little foreword by our own Peter Klein. So talk about Hayek's introduction and, and you talk about a little bit about Menger's influence on both Mises and Hayek. Hayek's introduction uh, to the book points out that the fundamental ideas of the Austrian school were Karl Menger's and Karl Menger's alone. And, I, and so, so Hayek um, was a big fan of Menger, uh, a, as was Mises. Uh, they both drew different things from him. They didn't take the same thing, but, but they, they both uh, absorbed the, the basic lessons of price and value theory. So um, overall, I think not only Hayek and Mises, but also, um, uh, as I mentioned in a little article I wrote on this, uh, Schumpeter, they all see Menger as the founder. In fact, I think at some point Mises says, um, before the 1880s, when some of Menger's students began to write, uh, there was no Austrian school. There was only Karl Menger who wrote his book in 1871. And Schumpeter actually uh, eulogized him and said he was nobody's pupil, which is a really, I think, an interesting quote. But let's talk about that, where he, he's writing in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire mm-hmm. in the late 1800s, which is really dominated by the German historical school. And as a matter of fact, they didn't much think economics was a separate field or a separate discipline at all. And they derided him with this term, he's an Austrian, meaning he was outside of the parameters of what they thought economics was, which wasn't much. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, they, they thought Austria was a, a sort of a, an academic backwater. Um, outside of German economics uh, and German thought. And so it was, uh, as at least you said, a term of derision. And, uh, but the Austrians then adopted it as a, a badge of honor. And uh, it, you know, it still remains so today. The, the historical school is completely forgotten, um, including Schmoller, in, including one of its last members, Zombart, who at the end of his life uh, claimed that uh, Hitler got his orders directly from, from God. So uh, that, that, that's what we, can, we think of, of, of the uh, historical school. So he's writing the book against this backdrop, but he is actually arguing for a holistic economics, that economics has its own universal laws and that it exists independently as a field apart from sociology or history or, or psychology or behavior. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that's absolutely true, um, uh, he, he, he talks about laws of economics. He says that uh, in, in the first line, all phenomena are subject to the law of cause and effect, including economic phenomena. So it, it, it is a real science. So looking at the introduction to the first German edition, um, the author of the, of the book blurb anyway says that this book, Menger's Principles, ought to rank up there with, for example, Adam Smith's Wells Nations, Karl Marx's Das Kapital, uh, anything by Ricardo or Keynes or Marshall. Do you agree? Is this one of the five or ten most important economics texts of in, of history? Oh, yeah. I, I would put it in the top ten and in the, and in the top five. Uh, for the Austrians, it may be the most important text. I mean, it, it did result in the founding of the Austrian School of Economics. So um, it's, a, it's an extremely important text. One thing I do want to mention is that uh, Menger was a bibliophile. So he read outside of, of the German historical school. He uh, knew all the cla- he knew the classicals um, through and through, and he knew also the continental economists, the, the German subjective value tradition, which ha- had had a long tradition going back to the early 1800s. And he was familiar with all of this. So although he was uh, completely original. Um, in a sense, his work was also a synthesis of the best that had been written in theoretical economics from the time of Adam Smith and before Adam Smith. So even though he is an originator, he's not making this stuff up without context or without being a, a, a deeply read guy on the literature of his day. Right. I, I think this is extremely important. He was deeply read uh, in, in everything that was written, not just in his day, but but before that, and that these thoughts um, – all came together, you know, as he was a he was a journalist, actually, um, and he was looking at markets. So he he had all this theoretical knowledge. He had this practical experience as a market analyst for newspapers for a number of years. And he came to the conclusion that um, what the classical school had said were the determinants of price, the cost of production. That just didn't explain what he was what, what he was observing on markets. And uh, so. Um, he saw that that prices could change from day to day, from moment to moment, if you're talking about commodities markets. And he he saw that it had to do with subjective value. 
which he also knew uh, from a theoretical sense, from a theoretical point of view, what was the foundation of action, of price. But as you point out, he wasn't trying to upend the classical school in any way. He was trying to advance it. He was trying to help us understand better where the idea of value and price comes from. Did he consider himself a classical or did he consider himself forging new territory? Yeah, well, two things on that. One, it's, it's a misconception to think that he was a revolutionary in the sense that he wanted to overturn the classical school. Um, he liked their explanation of day-to-day -day prices in terms of supply and demand, but they founded it because they f focused on, on, on cost of production. They founded supply and demand on the businessman's decision to, to buy in the cheapest markets and sell in, in, in the dearest markets. Whereas he said, no, no, we want to found this in the uh, um, human being striving to satisfy his or her wants. So um, that, that was a, an important um, uh, insight that, that he had. Well, I noticed there's a couple almost snarky comments by Frank Knight in his introduction about real supply and demand in the real world. Uh, both Mises and Menger get tagged as theorists. But what's interesting to me is there's this parallel. Well, bo both of them were trained as lawyers. Yes. And both of them end up working in government functions, actually dealing with numbers uh, in, in Vienna or for the Austrian government. So they, they, they sort of straddled uh, academia yes. and government and politics and teaching. And so they were very much not these ivory tower theorists in that sense. That's a great point. And that was true of all the Austrian economists. Bon Bavark was a minister of finance three different times. Wieser was a, was a minister of finance in, in the Austrian government. Menger worked as a journalist. They, they were all in contact with the real world. And uh, that's why in the, um, I think it's the preface to the book, where uh, Menger says that uh, he's looking to explain real prices, the prices that are found in reality. And Mises always emphasized that about the Austrian school. He said the undying, um, the Austrian school will, will have immortal fame because it explained real action and not just um, the non-action of equilibrium. So these guys were looking at, the, at prices as they were being determined moment to moment. And they came up with an exp a theoretical explanation based on Menger's original um, insights of these prices. Is part of the reason that these economists wore so many hats is that just the discipline wasn't as developed then? You might not be able to make a living full time as an academic economist. You had It, it wasn't seen as, as much as a standalone discipline as it is today. Right. It, it, it was um, uh, an avocation to many of these people. It wasn't a professionalized science at that point, though it was a science. And uh, there were very few economics chairs and they, and they were part of the law school. So you wrote an introduction really to his work and to his book that we'll publish online for people to read. Uh, although I do recommend, again, part of the reason behind this podcast is we're trying to get people interested in and send them to original sources. As I mentioned earlier, Principles of Economics in English, a very easy read. We have a cheap paperback available uh, to make it very much worth your while. Uh, but in that introduction, you talk a lot about his personal life, how he ended up being a consultant to the prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Talk a little bit about Menger the man. Well, Menger um, became the tutor of the crown prince. Uh, from and traveled through Europe, and it was very interesting when the lectures were finally published back in the 1980s or 1990s. Uh, his lectures to the prince, they were based on on Adam Smith. So he um, he did not uh, believe that 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 the classical school was worthless. He was not trying to overthrow the classical school. He thought a lot of the lessons that were drawn from the classical school were useful in everyday life, and he he liked the fact that the classical school. Uh, saw prices as not something random, but as something determined by by law, uh, and they also had a preference, a, a, an inclination toward um, a, a laissez-faire policies, which he was very sympathetic with. Now, do you think, in part, his legacy has been outshined by Mises and Hayek, and perhaps in part because? He just didn't write as much. He didn't have as long a career. I mean, we think of principles, but he actually wrote a book on method. Uh, he wrote a book attacking the German historical school. He's got more publications than we might recall. Yes, he's written a number of, of, of books, um, uh, two main books, his book on method, as you mentioned, and th then there was a this small pamphlet attacking the errors of, of the historical school. And he's got two fabulous um, articles, one on the theory of capital, a theoretical article that came out in 1888. And then another one on just called Money, Geld, uh, which came out in 1891 and was revised and, and is now in English. 
and it's very, very long. And uh, I think that was published in 1909, and then it's been translated into English. And um, I, I highly recommend the the, uh, the, the article on money. Um, now, ha has he been overshadowed by Hayek and Mises? Well, I, I don't think so. I don't think he's been overshadowed by them. They're just more recent writers, and they've applied a lot of these lessons, and of course, developed the theory um, that that he had first set out. Uh, and, you know, it's obvious that since they're more recent, the problems they're dealing with are, are something that people are more interested in. And, of course, academic publishing didn't really exist back then. You wrote, you wrote books of big theory. You didn't write articles focused on very narrow ideas. That's true. And, and we might want to point out that this book... This principles is really just an introduction. It, it was supposed to be a three-volume work on economic theory and policy that was to follow, and then that that Menger never followed up on. He got sidetracked, unfortunately, with this. Really, uh, turned out to be a real st a sterile debate with the historical school. Of course, he was right, and he made some great points against them, but um, he didn't quite understand praxeology at that point. So his work on methodology, though some Austrians think it's out outstanding, is not quite up to the same standard as his work on, on economic theory um, proper. Okay, so the book is published in 1871, and we fast forward to today. Menger's known as one of the godfathers of the marginal revolution. Sort of set the stage for us. What was the classical and neoclassical understanding of value and price at the time? Well, um, the classical economists, begin, being with Adam Smith and, and being carried on through Ricardo and, and, and John Stuart Mill, uh, they believe that or they, they analyze goods in terms of classes. Uh, you know, there was iron, there was water, there were diamonds, and these things were of different usefulness to human beings. Um, water was much more useful than diamonds. Diamonds, you know, for ostentatious display, whereas water was, was absolutely necessary to human life. Uh, and they, they came to a problem. They had a problem. They confronted a problem. And we call that problem the paradox of value. They said to themselves, wait a minute now, even though water is much more useful to humans than, than diamonds, uh, the fact is that diamonds have a much higher exchange value uh, than, than water does. That is a higher price on the market. So they split value into two. They said, on the one hand, there's use value, which is the usefulness of the good to human beings. And we all know that water is much more useful than diamonds. But on the other hand, there's exchange value, price, and, and diamonds have the higher price. Economics only deals, therefore, with exchange value. We take use value for, for granted. We'll say, yes, anything that has exchange value that is sold on the market is useful to human beings. But we don't analyze it any further than that. But when you get to that point and you just focus on, on, on price and not on the underlying consumer wants that, and values that, that indirectly bring about the price, you then shift your focus to the business decision maker. So, the, so, so, so prices are determined by the cost of production. Um, the, there's the, the cost of various things. And if, if uh, their explanation was that, look, diamonds cost more to produce. And as a result, their price on the market was higher. If you add in a, a margin for profit, then it's higher than, let's say, the production uh, bread, okay, even though bread might, might be more useful. Because it, it costs less to produce, uh, let's say, a pound of bread than it does one carat of diamonds. And that was their explanation. Uh, and on, day, on a day-to-day -day basis, their explanation was a little bit better. They said, well, yes, supply and demand change from day to day. But in the long run, the price tended toward its cost of production. So they're looking at all these inputs on the producer side, but it never really dawned on them to say this exchange value versus use value dichotomy is, is silly. What really happens is humans are subjective and, and based on circumstances, their wants and needs change. Right. Their, wa their wants and needs change. The quantities of the goods change. And each want it should be looked at individually. It's not a want for iron or it's not a want for water. It's, it's a want for a ton of iron or a want for a quart of water or, or, or a half a carat of a diamond. And, and at any given point in time, there are other wants that are competing with these different wants for different goods and, and also for the same good, but for different uses within that want. In the instant. Yeah, in the, the instant. Moment. Right, right. But if we're looking at inputs on the supply side, that starts to sound an, an awful lot like a cousin to the labor theory of value. We're looking at what went into producing a good or service, and that's to, to understand its value. 
Yeah, so I, I mean, there were there were two sort of cost of production theories of value. One was the pure labor theory of value, which was really Ricardo's. They both both the cost of production theory and the labor theory appeared in Adam Smith, but Ricardo focused on the uh, the pure labor theory, and that's what Marx picked up. Uh, whereas other classical economists focused on the money costs of, of producing the good, and uh, you know that that was the that formed the long run tendency of the price to settle at about the cost of production. Do you think it's a coincidence that Menger's book appears just a few years after Das Kapital, or do you think it it influenced what he wrote? You know, I'm not sure. He, he doesn't write much about Marx at all. He doesn't mention Marx at all in the principles. Um, and I haven't really seen any any academic articles that deal with the influence of Marx on Menger. So, uh, so I, 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 right. I, I'm, I'm kind of. But it's interesting today. We just assume everyone's reading everyone, whereas back yes. then the logistics of knowing what was going but, on in another part of the world, even in your own field, were not so simple. Yeah, that's true. Right, and and Marx hadn't uh, his his uh, Das Kapital hadn't come out yet in, in 1871. Yet he was a pamphleteer. He was he's a revolutionary. Um, he had written some things in economics, but I, I think Menger would have ignored him because the historical school was so dominant in, in German academia at the time. Okay, so that's really the shadow under which he's writing yes. at the time. So explain to us in lay terms, what, what is the marginal revolution? Why is it so important that we also look at the consumer side of things to understand value? Uh, so the marginal revolution really is a term that refers to the simultaneous discovery of this of the principle of margin utility, which I'll, I'll talk about, by three different economists, um, Menger and uh, the, uh, the the British economist uh, William Stanley Jevons wrote their works in 1871. Then a few years later, a, a very highly mathematical work was written by the uh, French Swiss economist um, Valras, uh, Leon Valras. Uh, all three of them struck upon the idea that. In order to understand value, you have to look at the individual units of the goods that are being valued and the concrete wants, the things that they are being valued for, that, that, that people wanted water for different uses. They wanted bread for different uses. They wanted uh, you know, various kinds of, 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 of other consumer goods. Um, they had, they had you know, numerous uses for these different things. In other words, wants were basically unlimited. And they were in different categories, but 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 they were ranked together on on one value scale, where people would compare and contrast the the, the, the different goods and their, and how important they were to, to serving their ends. So, what does the marginal revolution mean with respect to more or less of a good? You you used an example of bushels of wheat in your article on Menger, and and if a farmer has one or two, that that he yeah. views those differently than if he has ten or twenty. Yeah, so the, uh, the law of marginal utility basically states that um, the, uh, the, the, the greater the quantity that anyone possesses of a good, the, the lower the marginal utility of the good and the lower the value. Now, wh all that means is this. Marginal utility simply means um, the last satisfaction that can be served from that quantity of a good. So if you have five bushels of wheat and, and let's say you use the last bushel to feed um, chickens and, 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 and some other livestock, so that you can get milk and eggs and so on, then that is the value of that bushel. That is the marginal utility. Um, the most important use of, of a bushel of wheat may be the, uh, using it uh, just to keep yourself alive for the year, the first bushel of wheat. Uh, so if there's five different uses, Menger asks the question, and all five of these bushels are identical and they can all serve the same uses, how do you determine their value? Is it the average of the value of the five different uses, some more important than others? Or is it the value attached to the highest unit? He said, no. He says, think of the following. Think if, 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 if your uh, barn catches on fire and, and, and you need to, and you can only save for those five bushels. What end or what one is not served? And he said, well, the one that, is, that satisfies the least important one. That's the margin utility. So if you, if, if you subtract one unit, then what's given up is the satisfaction you expect to get from from the milk and 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 the eggs that you that you could have had for the year, and so that determines the value of all five bushels of each of those five bushels because no matter which one you lose, what you, the want that you do, do not satisfy, the satisfaction that you give up is the lowest valued satisfaction that that quantity could serve. And of course, all of this goes to the subjective mindset and also the circumstances of the consumer. 
So what is it about this that economics had missed up until then by looking at just the costs or the factors that it went into production and not looking at the subjective mindset of the consumer? I think one of the problems was even though many of the economists, especially French and Italian economists and some German economists, they saw that it was really value was rooted in, in, in people's subjective wants and in, in, in how they value different things. But they did not have this principle of margin utility that, 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 that Menger uh, um, hit upon. Okay? And, and margin utility referred to the relevant unit, the unit you're deciding upon. And that's what was missing. Even though some of some of the German economists actually had this uh, a notion of margin utility. Um, they never put it together with subjective value and created a whole theory of economics from it, a whole theory of price and value, as, as Menger did. But it seems that if we're not careful, it starts to sound a little bit or bleed over a little bit into psychology and behavior almost. If we're talking about people's subjective mindsets, for example, a, a heroin user, a junkie, mm -hmm. you know, that next gram of heroin might be worth just an infinite amount to alleviate mm -hmm. uh, the, the horrific pain of withdrawal, let's say. And so how do we stop from going down that slippery slope into what, what I don't like, for instance, behavioral yes. economics and psychology? Yeah, well, um, even though Menger and Bombava had slight, there were slight um, uh, psychological connotations in their discussions of margin utility and subjective value, they pretty much got, got rid of most of it. Um, they looked on it as simply, uh, when they talked about subjective, they just looked at it on, on it as a ranking of the different uses of the good. Uh, they did not try to measure utility. Uh, Menger had, you know, did, didn't spend any time measuring utility. He had an, a number in a numerical index for the wants. It's not clear if it was ordinal or cardinal. If he was just saying first, second, third, fourth, fifth, but for the most part, if you read them sympathetically, they they believe that utility or satisfaction was ordinal. That you liked one thing better than another. That it was more important for you to to bake bread with that than to make whiskey out of that that um, bushel of wheat. Let's say. And, and, and they acted accordingly. They, they, they never really got into this whole idea that you could measure utility. One of the uh, students of Menger, Wieser, believed that, that you could. Um, but for the most part, the uh, early Austrians uh, avoided that, tr that trap. So today, the marginal revolution is widely accepted in so-called mainstream economics. I mean, most people would understand that as you have more of something, each additional unit is worth less. Is, are people still challenging this idea? Well, no, they accept the marginal revolution. They interpret it a little bit differently. Um, they, they see marginal utility as the change, sort of the mathematical change in, in total utility, uh, though they claim that they're not uh, cardinal, they don't believe in cardinal utility, they believe in um, ordinal utility. So they, they would pay lip service to um, the marginal revolution, but yet they still use ratios of utility to goods, um, which are cardinal. So in effect, they, they've, they've lapsed back into a sort of cardinal interpretation of utility. Well, it seems some understanding of marginal utility can be shown in example when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez calls for 70% marginal tax rates at the highest levels. I mean, I, I think people instinctively understand that if you've got, you, you know, the first million dollars you make means more to you than the 10th million you make. Yes, but that that's true. And, and, and Austrians, you know, point out that that's true. But what is not true is that you can interpersonally compare these things, that a dollar to one person does not necessarily have the same um, value as a dollar to a second person. And a dollar to a rich person um, compared to a dollar to a poor person, you can't compare the value of the two because there is no unit of comparison. Menger never talked about a, 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 a subjective unit of comparison, nor did Bon Bavirk. Uh, in, today, in some of today's textbooks, you hear... Um, uh, when, when they do talk about cardinal utility, they talk about a util, but, but really, what the heck is a util? I mean, it doesn't exist um, in the same sense as an inch or a foot or a pound exists. Well, maybe there's some insatiable billionaire out there who burns for that next million exactly. more than he burned right. for the first. Right. Who's to right. say? Let me ask you this. Walter Block had some back and forth with his dissertation advisor, the, Gary Becker, the late Gary Becker, who's yes. a Nobel laureate. And one, one interesting thing uh, Professor Becker said to Walter Block was, you know, a, a lot of the most important or best elements of what we now call Austrian economics yeah. have been absorbed into the mainstream. So you guys are always acting like you're sort of outside, but we've actually absorbed that. D does Menger, does the Austrian school get the credit it deserves for understanding marginal utility? It's so important to value. 
No, I, I don't. I don't think they they have uh, their theory. The, the, the Austrian theory and, and uh, was in Menger's day and continues to be consistently subjectivist. That is that it, it is the wants of consumers from which you impute the value to to consumer goods, which in turn then uh, impute value to the higher order goods. That is goods that are the capital goods and and labor that are combined to make consumer goods. In other words, prices determine values. Um, uh, prices determine costs from the point of view of Austrian economists. Uh, without without something being valued, if diamonds suddenly were not valued, if we all adopted the values of, of the Amish, let's say, um, in, uh, who uh, eschew, uh, avoid any sort of, of um, ostentatious display, don't even have buttons on their clothing. Let's say, and so they, they put no value on diamonds as, as jewelry. So what would happen? If all Americans did that, or if everyone in the world did that, then diamonds would have no value whatsoever. But then the the, the salaries of of these uh, jewelers and 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 the value of of diamonds themselves and and of diamond mines they would all fall to zero because they would have no value in serving consumers ultimately. So subjective preferences and marginal utility help us very much understand an individual's value that he or she places on something. But now help us draw the connection between value theory and price theory, two different things, but closely related. Yeah, so, so what, what, what we should do is, 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 simple, is mention, um, before we get into that, is how Menger solved the value paradox. So the, the classical school could not explain and ignored um, the reasons why diamonds had a higher exchange value than, than did water. Uh, whereas Menga was able to simply point out that, look, um, in the case of diamonds, um, the quantity is so scarce in relation to human wants that the value of, of the marginal diamond is very high. It serves a very high value, whereas water is so abundant that if you lose a glass of water, you, you lose very, uh, you don't serve a want of very little value. You, something, you lose very little satisfaction from that. So therefore, uh, you know, water has a much lower price on the market than does, does diamond. Diamonds. However, if you, if you change the situation, you change the quantities of goods and the wants. If you put someone in the desert with a, a, a 46 carat diamond, which was worth 40, 46 million dollars recently at at auction, uh, and someone had a gallon of water, and the person, the owner of the diamond, had not had water for three days and was on the verge of of, of dying of thirst, he would certainly make that exchange because the gallon of water in that situation serves a much a want of much more importance than than does the diamond that he has in his pocket. So help us understand price formation as it relates to value. So price formation stems from the fact that people have different goods and different wants. So whenever any good is exchanged, Menger pointed out um, that the good that you were receiving would have to have a higher value to you than the good that you were giving up. So that um, in, in, in terms of, of an example that Menger may have given, um, if someone has 100 bushels of wheat and another person has a horse and uh, the, the person with the bushels of wheat would pay no more than, than 60 bushels of wheat and the person with the horse would not let the, the, the horse go for less than 30 bushels, well, then we know the price would settle between 30 and 60 bushels of wheat. And so as more competitors came in on each side of the market, the, the range of, in which the price would settle would be, would be much less. So if you're standing, for example, observing people walking up to a, um, a vending machine and buying a bottle of water for $2, some people purchase the water, others pass it by. Those people and only those people who purchase the water value the water more than the $2 or anything else that they could purchase with that $2 at that moment in time. Whereas a vending machine company values the $2 um, above the, the, the value of the water. Uh, and so what price does is to set the, um, what we might call the margin between those who value the good above the, the price and those who value below the price. And it's at the point where supply equals demand so that everyone who values the good the most receives that good. And, and, and all the people who value it less do not receive it. So when the market is working or is allowed to work, the goods go to only those people who, ha who, have, who value it most highly. But if everyone's an individual, everyone has subjective preferences, everyone has different uh, cardinal 
utilities, for things, or for services. Does that mean that what we ought to draw from Menger is that supply and demand moving towards equilibrium based on price isn't all that helpful to us, that equilibrium is not a very useful construct for economics? Well, that's a very good question. Menger had a, a, a d different concept of equilibrium than we have today. Um, Menger's concept of equilibrium was that exchange would take place up to the point where the last unit that the person purchased was no longer, or, or, or was if that person was just above the, the price paid, and that if that person purchased one more unit, it, it would be it would lower his utility, lower his his welfare because the 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 good would be less in value than the price. So if you if you go to Walmart and stand there and you watch people coming out with carts filled with different items from Walmart, um, you know three pounds of meat, um, two brooms, whatever that might be. Um, they purchase up to the point where there are no more gains from exchange. And Walmart, likewise, is in the same position. So in that sense, that's a realistic equilibrium. That's a re an equilibrium that occurs at every moment in time, that all ex gains from exchange, all exchanges that make both parties better off are completely exhausted at every moment on the market. So that's the kind of equilibrium that Austrians think is not only important, but is, is, is a, a true reflection of, of reality. I think Menger calls this a state of rest. Yeah, yeah I think he calls it points of rest. Yeah. But, but, yes, exactly. Has this ever happened with my wife on Amazon? Does this, <laughs> has this ever reached? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of that. Now, I want to move a little bit away from value, but before we do, one last point. I want to read a sentence to you from Menger where he talks about economic goods. He says, value does not exist outside of the consciousness of men. The value of goods is entirely subjective in nature. Before we leave this discussion, how radical was that sentence or that statement at the time? I think it was very radical. There were other people that other people that that did have that idea, but 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 the fact that Menger had used that idea to come up with a whole an entire theory of economics, a, a, a price, an integrated price and value theory, that is extremely radical. That is extremely original. It was something completely new uh, introduced into the world. Okay. Let's move to method. Uh, Mises says that Menger gave us a whole new method of economic theorizing. Mises later termed it praxeology. Uh, Menger uses the term economizing man. Uh, how radical was this? What was his method and what, what was the method of economics at the time in which he was writing this? Well, the, the method of the classical school was deduction, but they, they deduced their, their so-called laws of economics from uh, axioms or from um, what they would say are hypothetical uh, constructs. Whereas Menger used a deductive method and deduced it from something that was real, something that was observable in the real world, and that was people striving to satisfy their wants in the most economical way. And so step by step, Menger deduced his value theory and his price theory um, and then, then the theory of, of the price of capital, goods and wages and so on from a, a true um, fact. And, and, and so in, in some sense, th this was praxeology because human striving to satisfy their wants is the core of, of, of human nature. Every moment where we're continually using resources in a way that we believe will bring us the most satisfaction. And this was radical for the time? Was this denounced at the time? Um, no, it, it was it was a radical idea for the time. The historical school, of course, denounced it and uh, vigorously denounced it because they believed that that economics wasn't really a science that was separate from history. That there were no laws of economics as there were in the case of natural sciences. Um, and so, yeah, this was it, it, it was it was um, something original, and it was not accepted uh, for the most part in German academia. Well, there's this great quote from Mises where he said that I became an economist upon reading Menger's Principles. He reads it over Christmas time in 1903. H how much of an effect did this have on what we think of as the Misesian edifice of praxeology? I mean, would we have Mises as we know him today without Menger? No, I don't. <clears throat> I don't think we'd have Mises as we know him today without Menger. He uh, was uh, under the influence of the historical school. He was a social democrat. He didn't understand how the market worked. He didn't understand that there were laws of economics before he read Menger. I think this is what really just changed his whole mindset. 
So without laws of economics, what do we have? It's it's pure history. It's pure data collection. It's almost public and private finance. Right. It's 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 collecting all these statistics and then and then pouring over them and trying to divine some laws or regularities uh, in these um, in, in these uh, that are given to us by these statistics. But of course, we know there's 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 there are no human laws or there are no laws that you can derive just by looking at. Uh, past actions and, and categories of actions and, and so on. Um, it's something that you must derive or deduce from a, a, a true um, fact or an axiom. So even in Menger's time, we have an allusion to this split between hard and soft sciences and what's the proper method. Do we look at data and form a hypothesis and test it? Or do we know certain things deductively, axiomatically? Nobody was talking about economics as a social science in, in Menger's day, though. Uh, right. I mean, as we said that, uh, as I mentioned before, economics was part of the law faculty in France, in Germany, in Austria. Uh, so you did have this split, uh, the split between the empirical sciences. Uh, Menger talks about it in his book on methodology. Um, he called economics an exact science, and 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 he called uh, economic history was uh, an empirical science. He believed that there, 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 there was definitely a use for statistics and empirical observations in economics, but, but not in, in, in the uh, department of economics that we know as economic theory. So Menger talks about higher and lower order goods and production processes in, in principles. He gets a little bit of grief from Frank Knight in the introduction mm -hmm. for doing so, but it also presages to an extent Hayek's work uh, Roger Garrison's work talking about lower and, and higher order yes. goods and implicitly, at least, the, the temporal element of all that. Uh, give us Menger's perspective on lower and higher order goods, the importance of them, and how we go about imputing value to various stages of production. Uh, Menger focused on, on the law of cause and effect. So he brought this into um, close uh, connection to the idea of production and consumption. So what Menger pointed out was that um, consumer goods, which he called goods of, of the lowest order or of the first order, directly sat, caused the satisfaction. He used the term called cause the satisfaction of the want. But what caused the production of the consumer good? And that was, if you're talking about bread, well, then that was the, the flour, the ovens, and, and the baker's labor that was combined to produce the bread. And, and that only had value because it led to the production of, of the consumer good, which had value because in turn it caused the satisfaction of the want. So let me just stress that Menger looked at production as going from the highest order goods, from land and labor and, and, and mineral deposits and so on, down through capital goods and factories and, 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 and so on, down to the satisfaction of, of the final want of the consumer. So production proceeded from the higher to the lower, but satisfaction and value proceeded from the lower to the higher. So consumer goods only had value because they satisfied wants. But then again, why did the goods that led to the production of consumer goods only ha uh, have value? Only because they caused the production of the, of the, of the um, consumer goods. And so Menger pointed out that the um, classical school looked on value as coming from the higher orders. But he said, if that were the case, all, you, all you're doing is pushing back the explanation further and further back that the uh, diamonds were valuable because the, the diamond mine was val valuable. But the point is, why was the diamond mine valuable? And or you know why were the original factors the land the lake why were they valuable, and 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 the, the classical school could not answer that. Okay, you you have to switch the causality of di of of value back to the, the consumer. You put you put as he said man at the center of economics and his wants, and then the satisfaction of wants then cause value to be imputed backwards all the way up to the diamond mine. So the diamond mine was only valuable because the diamonds, which eventually was a product of that mine through many stages of production, were valuable in satisfying human wants. But doesn't all of this presage the idea of time preference? The, the capital entrepreneur or investor is taking a risk and mm -hmm. he or she is foregoing current consumption. 
And inherent in all of this is time. Menger doesn't talk about time preference or he doesn't talk about no. the temporal elements or roundaboutness right. much. But again, we have the benefit of hindsight. Yes. This is an incredible insight mm -hmm. for the time. He does say that he does say in one section that production does take time and that there uh, as a result is uncertainty in the production of goods. We don't know if any particular production process will will be um, successful. Uh, and he does talk about the entrepreneur. So he brings uncertainty in and implicit in, in, in the idea that there's time in production is time preference, although he does not talk about an interest theory um, in his book on principles. No, he, he, right. He doesn't give us an interest theory, but it, it's interesting that you point out he, he does give a nod to the entrepreneur because uncertainty doesn't just go to the production process. It goes to the entrepreneur's life. He, he or she could die. He or she could, could suffer some sort of loss. So in your article about Menger, uh, you lay out the four uh, elements or the four functions of entrepreneurship that this yeah. guy is, is, again, very prescient in pointing out, anticipating future wants, engaging in economic right. calculation, uh, the active will, and then the supervision of at least some sort of process yes. or employees. I mean, this is all pretty heady stuff. Yeah, um, I think what's important here, too, is to realize that Menger was talking about um, a real flesh and blood entrepreneur. So it wasn't just somebody who forecasts the futures. Um, uh, Mises has two sorts of entrepreneur in, uh, in his book on uh, human action, um, where he talks about a pure entrepreneur who's simply a forecaster. But then he talks about what he calls a promoter entrepreneur who performs all of these functions, well, the, the, uh, which include property ownership and property supervision. Uh, unfortunately, many Austrians have interpreted Mises as, as, as only uh, dealing with entrepreneurship as the forecast, forecasting of the future okay. and not a, in, a, as uh, someone who calculates, as someone who um, supervises the production process and who cannot, you cannot divest yourself of that function. Um, you are a property owner, uh, and as a capitalist entrepreneur, you have to invest capital. Entrepreneurs have to have some capital. Um, that's pointed out by Mises, pointed out by Menger. And as a result, there are these other ancillary functions in addition to forecasting the future. And I think Menger gives a very good short explanation of this in, in, in his book. So the entrepreneur is also a steward of existing property, trying to make sure it's not dissolved and that it grows. And, and of course, Menger's writing all this without the benefit of, let's say, a lot of the legal theory of the late 19th and early 20th century, Mises' is liberalism, which really posits property as, right. as a key element of yeah. liberalism. Again, Menger is, is having to find his way in the dark, even yes. about property. Yes. No, right. I mean, he, he makes a, a great statement about property there. He has a good insight into property that um, property does not just consist of things, random things. It consists of a, a, a structure of different goods which are put together by the uh, the individual, uh, we can call him the entrepreneur if you wish, uh, in a way that will satisfy his wants. So property is an integrated structure of things uh, and it's continually changing from moment to moment. And the purpose of the changing is, is, is to improve people's welfare. And uh, he understood that property had to exist in, in order to, to bring about the satisfaction of wants. Well, and by talking about production and, and higher order, order and lower order goods and even the entrepreneur, the individual economizing man, yes. he, in a sense, he's animating this old dreary uh, land labor capital idea. He, he's giving it some, some, some framework for us. So we, do, so we have to understand that individuals have to animate all of this. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's actually getting rid of just this whole idea of the classical economists that you had these three categories of, of, of factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Um, in, fa in fact, they did, the classical economists did not even try to explain the prices, the, the prices of these individual units of things. Um, their distribution theory was, was terrible it, 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 and wasn't even as good as their, their, their um, price theory. Whereas Menger, in the preface to his book, says um, he, wa he wants to explain real prices, but not only that, he wants to integrate under price theory all wages, interest rates, and so on. So he's talking about getting rid of this idea that distribution is something different. Distributing incomes is something different from pricing. Once you price everything, then, then the owners of those things, the property owners, then have incomes. Incomes are secondary. 
Okay, it's it's the pricing process that must be explained, and then then incomes are naturally fall out of all that, and that's a very very important insight. I was talking to Peter Klein about a week or so ago about how nobody really does a lot of economic theory anymore. Nobody writes treatises. And as I'm listening to you right now, it strikes me that this shows the danger of these narrow specializations, the idea of, that Menger has that everything has to be understood in terms of a relationship, in terms of the whole economy and in terms of time. And, and uh, it, it strikes me that economics today has gotten small, as Peter says, that, it's, that economists don't focus on the big picture. Yes. Uh, in fact, Mises says there can be no such thing as agricultural economics, resource economics, labor economics. You have to understand the overall theory. And that was Menger's point. Men Menger really did unify and integrate economic theory in a way that even his fellow marginalist revolutionaries like Jevons and Valras did not do. Uh, so this, I think, was a very important contribution of Menger and one that Austrians are, st are, are, you know, are still indebted to, what can be called general interdependence. Everything in the economy is interdependent. No sector of the economy can be isolated and explained alone. Now, you might want to focus on one sector, but you have to keep in mind the laws of economics that apply to all sectors and how these sectors interact with one another in order to explain a particular phenomenon. But even with that interdependence, there's no macro flavor to this book. It's always about – it always comes back to the individual. He doesn't talk about aggregates at all, for example. Uh, he, he never does. Um, it, it, it's, it's – I don't want to even use the word microeconomics. It's, it's economics because economics is focused on the individual. It's general economics, whereas a micro and macro is, is, is sort of an artificial splitting of economics into certain problems which are like macro that you know, affect the overall economy. But still, the individual units, the individuals who are, who are um, in the economy, are the, their actions are accounting for these outcomes. Menger realized all of that. And I think um, that's one of the most important lessons that he's, as I, I'm repeating myself, imparted to, to uh, our, uh, contemporary Austrians. Well, I want to talk about the end of the book. He finishes with a section on money. Yes. It's a little unsatisfying compared to the zestier parts of the book about price and value. And it almost seems like it was uh, an afterthought for him. He does talk about the origins of money, but he doesn't go much farther than that. He doesn't seem radical in his exposition right. of, of money's role in the economy. Yes. Uh, in fact, money doesn't really play a role in, in, in the book. I mean, he's really talking um, in his price theory pretty much about a barter economy. He's, he's explaining everything in, in, in barter terms. Money's sort of a shadow in the background. Um, I think in his planned three treatises, money would have come in and been integrated. Now, he did write a very important article, as I mentioned, on money later on, in which he's one of the first people to fully understand that the demand for money is not simply the fact that there are goods that need to be sold, that the demand for money is the demand to, by the individual to hold cash balances, to hold sums of money in order to make certain payments, certain investments, and so on. And that that is also dependent on, on how a person values various units of money. But that comes later on, as you said. So in this book, uh, in, in, in the book that we're talking about, Principles, he's is only talking about how money originates. And he does make an extremely important point, and that is that money cannot originate as a, a pure paper money that that the state issues and stamps that money must be accepted in business uses in in, in uses you know by, uh, by consumers and so on now implicit in that is that people have to hold money but he doesn't really come out and say that so there is not a a, a monetary theory in, in any sense outside of just how, you know how did money originate does his paper on money which i have not read does yeah. that give us a mungarian monetary a theory, or is it too short? Uh, it's a fairly long paper, but it, it really focuses on the side of the demand for money and how that is rooted in individual choices. So he doesn't come out with a, with a full-blown theory of the value of money. That, that was left to Mises, and Mises based his theory of the demand for money, which is one side of, 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 of the uh, mo monetary equation, supply and demand. He, uh, he based his demand for money um, the uh, theory on, on, on Menger um, explicitly. And of course, Mises' first full-length book, The Theory of Money and Credit, 
applies the marginal revolution or the insights of it to, to money. Right. Does that mean that Menger had a blind spot, that, that he failed to discover what Mises would discover a couple decades later? Well, he never he never completed his 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 theory of money. I mean, I, he may have intended to. Um, he only got as far as talking about the demand for money. He never really applied the margin utility theory to the value or the purchasing power of money, which is what Mises did. Um, it's not clear whether he accepted the old style quantity theory. He he didn't really seem to say that he did. Um, Bombaver Mises says when he gave his chapters of his book. In Bombavark's seminar, who Bombavark was Menger's student, rejected what Mises had to say. So, well, yeah, you're right, but it's just sort of a, you know uh, an enhancement of of the basic quantity theory. So maybe Menger did not under, fully understand the implications of the marginal revolution for money. We really don't know. Um, so uh, you know, but his explication of money as originating as a commodity, as the most saleable commodity yes. in society. Was that a radical insight for its time? Yes, I, I think I think it was a radical insight for its time. Um, I, I think for the most part, you can see some statements by classical economists and some earlier French and Italian economists saying things like money um, comes from uh, acceptance of, of a, a commodity in exchange, but they didn't explain it in the step-by-step -step fashion that Menger did. So once again, Though people had insights into value, uh, in, in, into margin utility, and so on, and into the origination of money, uh, they they didn't they didn't tell us the full story. I mean, Menger was a genius well, well, in, in able, being able to do that. But most people in his environment would have said, "Money comes from the Habsburgs, or money comes from the Kaiser." M well, well, some of them, <laughs> some of some of them did 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 say, say those types of things. Uh, the German historical school, Knopp, uh, who was the uh, uh, monetary theorists uh, or non-theorists um, claim that money was simply, the value of money was simply determined by the state. Okay. And wrapping up, I just want to get back to the the book itself, Principles of Economics. Oftentimes people ask us what to read. Um, human action's a tough first go. People recommend Man, Economy, and State sometimes as an easy read. We Oftentimes we recommend Economics in, in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. It seems like we almost forget sometimes principles of economics because it was translated. Maybe people think it's 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 old and therefore I had to read something 20th century. But this is a really a great introductory book for anybody and an, an easy, punchy read. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think um, it's right up there with with, with Hazlitt, Hazlitt's economics in one in one lesson with um, Rothbard's What Has the Government Done to Our Money? I think it, it should be one of the first five books that you read. Um, it's very clear. It's very well written. And um, the arguments are very easy to follow. Well, again, Principles of Economics by Carl Menger, published in 1871. Uh, it, it's only a portion of what he wrote, but it's perhaps the most important part of it. Uh, we have this book available free on our website. Just go to Mises.org and Google Menger. You'll come up with this really quickly. You can read it in a PDF format. Uh, and of course, there's the original English version with the introduction by Frank Knight. If you can find that, you will see what I'm talking about, that Knight was perhaps not his biggest fan. But our version of it, which is a very cheap paperback, I think we sell it for 7 or $8, has an introduction by Hayek and a forward by our own Peter Klein. Uh, we'll link to all this uh, with, with some of the podcast links. And uh, if you'd like a copy of the book, find me on Twitter or uh, just go to our website. And that said, Joe Slerner, I want to thank you for your time. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, check out Manger. I think this is the kind of thing where the Mises Institute can really provide you uh, with the literature you need to understand first principles, and you're going to benefit highly from reading this book. Uh, I absolutely recommend it. That said, thanks very much. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.